Hello everyone, I'm Susan Cole. And I'm Vanessa Appiah. And welcome to Health and Power, the live broadcast series on health inequalities affecting people of colour and crucially steps we need to take to fix it. Thanks so much, Susan. So today, as ever, we have fantastic guests and always excited, but very excited today. So first of all, we have Dr. Annabelle Sowamimo, who is a doctor, academic, activist and writer. And as well as being a sexual and reproductive health registrar in the NHS, she's also the co-director and founder of the charity, the Reproductive Justice Initiative, RJI. And this was formerly known as Decolonizing Contraception, which I'm sure many of you have heard of. And this really aims to address health inequalities and racial disparities. And on top of all of that, um, she is a part-time PhD student at King's. <laughs> And then we also have the pleasure of having Dr. Jessica Okosan, who is an associate professor at the Bart Cancer Institute with Queen Mary University of London and a consultant hematologist at St. Bartholomew's Hospital in London. She has clinical and research expertise in the area of lymphomas. And Jessica is the chair of the Bart Cancer Center's Patient and Public Involvement Research Advisory Group and also a member of the Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Task Force for the European Haematology Association. So as ever, accomplished guests, and we're really looking forward to having our conversation. Fantastic. Yes, I'm really excited. So much expertise and knowledge with, uh, with our guests. And um, Vanessa, we, we often talk each episode about some of the issues in the news impacting on the health of people from racially minoritized communities. And I know recently there's been quite a lot around quite harrowing um, coverage in relation mm. to anti-migrant rhetoric, which mm. I think really affects so many of us. But also I've just been thinking about, you know, when we talk about health inequalities, often the focus is on how we might be treated in the health service but I think it's important to also remember that that our health through being affected by racism can also impact on us in relation to like premature aging and and uh, chronic diseases that I think often people don't really consider. Definitely Susan and I think we have so many examples I mean it's kind of day in day out you kind of dread each morning what you're going to read um on the internet about what's happened somewhere in the world. And you can guarantee that um, there will, there's gonna be something that's triggering in some way. And whether it's a small amount or a large amount, um, it affects us. And I think one of the things that you're highlighting is about this concept of weathering, which is a concept that it really says that by having repeated exposure to you know, socioeconomic adversity, marginalization in many forms, racism and perpetual um, discrimination can affect our health. And it's the kind of repeated exposure of this that is really important to um, acknowledge. And it affects aging, it affects this data about cardiovascular heart health, um, there's um, data about just other parts of our physical health, and also as you'd expect, our mental well-being as well. So it's, it's not just a concept, we're living it and we're experiencing it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I know one of the issues links to cancer. So I think it'd be really great to bring on a cancer specialist. No, I know, I know. We're very, very lucky to have <laughs> it all so links have... together. So we'll um, have our conversation with Jessica and bring that in. So that's Hi. great. Yeah, we can have <laughs> Jessica on, please. Hi, Jessica. Thank you so much for, for coming on. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Really pleased to be part of this series. Oh, wonderful. And um, Jessica, one of the things that, that we have discussed is the, um, the, the inequalities around cancer um, affecting people from racially minoritized communities. I know um, for me, I, I had breast cancer um, 20 um, 10 years ago and 
from initially finding a lump, it took six months for me to actually get um, a diagnosis. What do you think is actually driving um, these sorts of inequalities? And, and, and what's your professional experience of this? Yeah, no, it's, it's an excellent question. I think we, we recognize that there are sort of racial and ethnic disparities, um, particularly in solid cancers, you mentioned in, in sort of breast cancer. But I mean, I'm, I'm a specialist in sort of blood cancers. Actually, that's very that's less well recognized. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting, I want to try and give an example in terms of what why we don't really have a very good understanding of this. So Cancer Research UK is one of the biggest sort of, you know, charitable cancer research organizations. So if you go to their website on cancer statistics, you can find the data on, you know, discrepancies in terms of outcomes between gender, so men and women, old and young, social economic group, but there's actually no data publicly regarding, you know, the outcomes for different ethnicities or different racial groups. So there's a not a lot of awareness. I think that's one of the challenges. And I think that's the other thing that people, um, is that we, there are differences that are just not out there. So in the US, for example, they've collected data on this. So just to give you an example, in blood cancer, so the you know, lymphoma, which is one of the cancers that I treat, there is a 10% difference in outcomes between white Caucasians and people of black origin. So 10%, a huge amount. And, you know, and similarly, the access to treatment is very different. So stem cell transplantation, we use that for, it's a potentially curative option for leukemias. Again, there's a significant lower number of black uh, patients that receive stem cell transplantation. So lots of disparities there. You know, you raise a really good question about why there are differences in these outcomes. I think there are lots of causes, you know, potential causes. I think we see the disparities because perhaps there is also lack of engagement from the from the from the communities. There is sort of this historical miss or distrust of the healthcare team um, and sort of low participation in things like clinical trials, which is something that I um, am a really strong advocate for. Why do why does there such a low number of patients from sort of black and Asian backgrounds that participate in clinical trials? So I think there's there's a number of different areas which which you know, which impacts these sort of disparities. And uh, it's, uh, you know, to kind of improve these things, we kind of need to be able to shine a light on it. We need data, we need awareness, um, and we need to try and pick out these different problems because obviously these things are very complex, uh, you know, as a whole. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. And I think um, you, you've just explained so clearly in terms of what may be the drivers and you alluded to, you know, how do we move forward and what could the potential solutions be or any actions that you think that we are needed to address it? Yeah, I mean, I think we know that there are a number of sort of access or structural barriers to accessing care. And it kind of stems from a number of different things. You know, language barriers certainly is one of them, cultural barriers, uh, you know, get, you know, being able to sort of, there's sort of different levels of health literacy also. So I think that, and that may also stem from this sort of cultural and language barriers. Um, we've tried very hard to make sure that information that we have available is available in, in multiple languages so that people from a range of different backgrounds have access to that. I mean, working, as you know, Vanessa, working in sort of East London, we've probably got, you know, the most ethnically diverse region in the country, but it also encompasses the most, one of some, some of the most deprived boroughs um, in, in, in the UK. So we have a number of challenges there and how do we kind of break some of those barriers? And I think it's sort of raising awareness increasing our reach because sometimes the, the challenge I think that we have as healthcare professionals is we need to be able to advocate for our patients from different backgrounds. And I find that what typically happens is many patients that have ethnic minority backgrounds get shoved into my clinic. I think it's perhaps because they just think, well, Jessica kind of is from that background. A lot of the patients sort of the level of, you know, the, there is very interesting data about patients um, you know, the concordance between sort yeah. of the, the physicians, the, the healthcare professionals and the patients that it, so, it certainly leads to improved communication, improving outcomes. And so I think that one of the things that we need to try and do is increase diversity also of, you know, at many levels, you know, diversity of our healthcare professionals, of our nurses, you know, leadership, you know, we, it's very difficult to enact change when um, when the, the healthcare force that are looking after the patients aren't representative of the patients that we're seeing. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. And one of the issues um, that, that comes up quite a lot 
and with people I speak to when we discuss clinical trials people say well you know I I don't want to do that I don't want to be experimented on and what can we do to improve diversity in research yeah no it's it's a really challenging problem you know I think something like less than one percent or something it's a very low number of of patients from a kind of a black and Asian background participate in clinical trials and as you say there is this kind of you know mistrust or this idea that there'll be patients will be guinea pigs in, in so I think there are a number of ways that we can try and improve the sort of underrepresentation. Um, there is there are some frameworks that are being developed at the moment. So in the UK, there's something called um, the NIHR Include um, uh, framework. Yeah. So it's a kind of ethnicity framework that provides a roadmap of how we could increase include you know inclusion of underserved groups in our clinical research. And I think it's Although it's it's still a framework, at least it provides some sort of benchmark. So if we're designing clinical trials, we should be asking as people designing these trials, will my trial design make it harder for certain ethnic groups to be able to engage with the clinical trials? Do I have the right sort of patient information to be able to allow them to um, access these trials? So I think that you know improving clinical trial access by this sort of framework may shift things a little bit. Um, the other thing, I guess, that well, one was really interesting, and I'll, I'll tell you the sort of really interesting story that happened a couple of years ago. So at the largest sort of hematology conference uh, in the world, which is normally in the US, the, in the plenary session, there was a trial that pre presented about a drug called CAR T cells, which is a very revolutionary treatment. And after the plenary speaker spoke, then um, a participant stood up and asked how many ethnic minority uh, patients were included in the clinical trial. Mm. And the plenary speaker said they didn't know because this information was not collected at all. And so that's really sort of, it really, that was the very first time for me that made me really think about participation. And we don't even collect that data. We have no understanding of who is participating in our research. And yet we think that data that we're getting from clinical research is going to be broadly applicable to all racial groups when we don't even collect that data. So um, I think that we need better frameworks. Um, in the US, for example, there is this um, drive initiative, which is basically to try and document, you know, um, you know, participation of um, patients from different ethnic minorities to almost rank clinical trials. So basically, for example, if you've got, you know, like almost like a diversity score for clinical trials, um, to be able to say that, you know, this clinical trial is ethnic, you know, has basically ticks all the boxes for this drive criteria, which is having, you know, um, ethnic, making sure you have ethnic representation on the clinical trials, having a DEI, so a diversity, equity and inclusion officer as part of the clinical trial setup. So there, I think there are a number of ways that we are trying to, you know, a multi-pronged approach to try and tackle, you know, improving representation on clinical trials. Thanks so much, Jessica. I, and it, again, everything that you've outlined there is so important in terms of, you um, just really bringing that diversity aspect. And I just wanted to, as we end, just pick up on something that you met, mentioned earlier in terms of, um, you know, not only representation within the patients, but the staff themselves and the people, um, uh, you know, designing the trials. And I, I think it, it's really important to, you know, highlight, you know, yourself as a black woman in science that is leading research. And that is, you know, quite frankly, quite few and far between. And, and I think that that pipeline of having women in science and also black women in science is just so important. Yeah, I completely agree. We, we're there to try and be role models that shine a light and, you know, trying to empower the next generation. They need, we need more of us to be, you know, to be present so that people see that diversity, right? So, so important. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so, so much, so Jessica. <laughs> it's gone thank really you. quickly. No, thank you very much. Thank, you. thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Yeah, raise so many really important issues. I think also in terms of research, co-production mm. is really, uh, really, really important as well. And there's meaningful engagement of people from the communities because so often it's just this tokenistic engagement that we see so often 
Well, exactly. There's certain buzzwords that, you know, people will put into um, bids and grants, you know, and they'll throw in meaningful, they'll throw in authentic, you know, all, all the right words to show that you are going in the right direction. But, you know, those words must be matched with action. And we know, very, you know, from the work that we do and um, we support and engage with that you can't take that for granted. And so there's got to be a lot of active and intentional work to really make sure that engagement is truly meaningful. Absolutely. And, and thinking about what, what Jessica was saying, just, just around in terms of things like, like breast cancer, it just really mm -hmm. makes me think of the intersections, particularly as black women that we face, um, around our health and I mean it's one of the things that we can discuss um, with um, with Annabelle but one of the things that she wrote about in Divided is you know black women not being believed when we speak about our pain in, in hospitals and I, I also think it's not just our physical pain but you know when we talk about our emotional pain or if we cry you know it, it it's not treated in the same way there isn't the same compassion for for black women as to women from from other groups susan i think that word is exactly it. it's the compassion it's the empathy um and i think sadly it just doesn't um it doesn't rest as an adult so across the life course of women but across the life course of black women the perception of us as um, stronger than our counterparts, even at a young age, um, there's this concept of ad adultification bias, um, where you can have two eight-year-olds playing together, one is of black ethnicity, one is of white ethnicity, and the perception and response to them both crying is very different. So, um, and we, we've seen that in some of the sad things that have happened in some of the management of um, kids of black ethnicity in school. So I think very much so that the the experience unfortunately extends across the life course and the work that we do really needs to work go across the life course to make a difference absolutely so shall we bring on annabelle hello hello hello, hello. Annabelle. i i have to say loving loving the book <laughs> That is a, a picture so to be nice. beholden. Um, and I, I, I'm surprised because I'm in Ghana, so I've got my book in Ghana, so I had it <laughs> over. So there we go. But no, wow, Adam, thank you. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thank you for having me. No, we're really excited to have you. And I think um, we cannot do it justice without giving you a huge congratulations on Divided. Um, it has been beautiful to watch just um, just the reception it's gotten and the positivity and the conversations. And, you know, we don't take it lightly because it could have been a very different narrative. So um, kudos to you. So we're very excited to have you today. And I wanted to, first of all, pick up on something, you know, a recent interview that I, I spent Sunday reading, um, which was a fantastic interview, actually, in the Shadow um, Independent magazine. And I really urge people to read it. But the statement, you know, the call out statement um, that you described the NHS as a site of structural violence. And it's a powerful statement. And I think um, I would love we would love to hear more about your reflections about this. Yeah, absolutely. So I was interviewed by, um, by somebody wonderful, Karian, um, from Race and Health who also does amazing work um, in his own right. And I think um, in that way, it was a real, uh, it felt less of an in interview and more of like this intellectual discussion where we're swapping ideas. And actually, I think Kavian probably brought it to, brought it to the fore, but it's something that um, I've thought through also. And I guess in Divided, it is really exploring that issue. Yeah. Although I was probably less explicit in those terms. So when we talk about structural violence, somebody that wrote quite a lot about this, um, Dr. Paul Farmer, a medical anthropologist, um, and looking at essentially how forms of structural oppression um, and how that ca causes further forms of violence in people's lives. So the disproportion of death, 
amongst uh, racially marginalized groups of people, how how that happens, how that plays out. And you picked up on one of those issues already. And it's like um, medical silencing and who gets believed. Mm. OK, and how uh, health professionals can act as gatekeepers, sometimes unknowingly that um, that we're doing that, whether that's in acting migration policy that's kind of been carved out and saying that people can't get access to maternity care, not knowing the right policy and then restricting that. So that adds to the burden of disease and mortality among some groups or even just the NHS and the history of the NHS, because often the history of the NHS is very is m- very much painted out as, um, you know, this, this endeavor that not many people were using it, and it was quite sufficient just um, in terms of when it was when it was created. But the NHS has always been reliant on uh, labor from former colonies in the Commonwealth. It was actually almost couldn't, it couldn't have been established without this. And in Divided, I talk very much about my own family's history, kind of three generations in the NHS, my grandma working as a nurse in auxiliary, my dad migrating here from Nigeria as an SHO, and now myself. And obviously, that whole process means that it means various things, but it means the health system relies on brain drain from countries that are already have weak health systems. So, uh, you know, we have nurses often coming from the Philippines, they have to send money home. So there's that constant system. And I don't think there's enough reflection on what that means for some of those countries and how we haven't really built a health system that is sustainable. So we're automatically prioritizing communities in the diaspora and white communities in the UK. And people say, well, the money's getting sent home, but it's much more complex because when they come to the UK, what jobs are they doing? We saw in COVID, disproportionately, these these, these uh, groups of people are lower cadres of staff. So they can't move up to jobs where they're probably, their health is better protected. And often they can't bring their families increasingly, right? Yeah. So you're working, you're working, you're working, and you don't have any quality of life. So when we talk about structural violence, we're not just talking about the disproportionate inequities that exist for the groups in this country, but we're also talking about the people that have to maintain this system and what it what it means um, for, for them. And in that way, um, I often say that the NHS was very much built um, by people who were never meant to be cared for by this system that was never factored into the plan. Um, so the inequity was almost baked into the system and we've not really taken time to reflect on that. It, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's so true. I always say it was built for, for the majority and not for the minority and those, and unfortunately the minority is the ones that actually has been buffering and holding up um, the NHS and driving it forward. Um, thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, thank you so much, um, Annabelle. And one of the things I've seen that your book's been described as a, a vital course for, for mm. action so what what needs to change what action do we need now yeah I mean it's such a big question and for me you know for, I, I wrote it very much as I hope it does push people but I also wrote it as like an introduction in many ways to some of these issues where people may not have explored um, it through this kind of um, healthcare through this racialized or colonial lens before so um, there is a lot <laughs> that needs to change in many ways. Um, first of all, the inequity in the system in terms of, we still got lots of things wrong in terms of like postcode lottery, we've got a north-south divide in terms of he- health care, mortality outcomes in the UK. And fundamentally, a lot of these things cannot change unless we really interrogate, you know, whose health matters in that sense, right? Um, Very often the distribution of resources within the NHS, we kind of go, we're going to distribute them evenly, even though that's not what happens, when actually when we talk about equity, we know what it means is that if you see that there's a burden of disease that's higher in a certain group, you need to throw more resources at that specific group to level the playing field, right? And we're never going to get to better outcomes unless we do that. And we do that um, quite aggressively, right? In terms of redistributing the resources that we have. But people 
often feel a lot of pushback about that um, when you say that's what needs to be done. And that's why we, we are yet to see any particular change. And in, in many ways, the health divide is growing. Um, I think also, um, so many people have said this already, but it's kind of like at the moment putting a Band-Aid on social issues with the NHS. A lot of money goes into healthcare at kind of the dire end point, right? When actually we need to plug loads of money into social issues before yeah. we get into dire straits in people's health. Yeah. And um, that will take a long time to see changes. We know that, right? You don't get immediate return on kind of investment for building holistic health services that can look at people's housing, look at, you know, uh, mental health issues, all of these in one go. You won't see returns for a really long time. So people keep going for quick fixes, especially because that's how elections are won. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, that's the truth, really. It's um, really hard in a lot of industry, in a lot of sectors, but in health it's particularly hard because people always think in short term um, and actually, we really need a lot long term planning, which invests quite heavily in social problems. And then you would see better health outcomes overall. And a lot of clinicians know this, right? When we see people with chronic diseases or end stage diseases, when you look at the whole picture, you know that you could have probably stopped this in motion probably about 20 or 30 years ago. You know, yeah. um, but, very but that's the, Oh, sorry, go on. No, 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 I'm done. <laughs> no, 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 I, I got excited when you were saying that because um, it, it, it's so true. That's the painful thing, that when you're working in it, you can see that if we'd actually done some changes, tweaked something just five years ago, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, the, the difference would have been transformative. And it feels it feels difficult when we talk about equity because you've articulated so clearly that if we're thinking about people that have certain inequalities, they need more resources thrown at them. They need to be finally prioritized and invested in. Um, and you need them, you need to give them time to respond to it and not expect them to suddenly um, gaining health within 50, you know, you know, one year and then to see a change and say, right, I'm, I'm, it's justified. Um, but Annabelle, I wanted to pick up something as well, quite personal with yourself, because, you know, you're a black woman working in healthcare. And the lens that you bring to writing this book is really unique. And I think that's the beauty of it. And it's 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 rarely shared what, you know, we within medicine go through and, and, um, and what we see and how that impacts us. And I wonder whether you just um, talk a bit about that, you know, being a, a black woman in health, being a black medical student and moving forward. Um, how was that for you? Yeah, thank you. So I think, you know, when we talk about lived experience, ultimately, lots of people's lived experience is going to be very different, even if, you know, they share the same characteristics as me. Um, but then a lot of people have the shared the shared experiences that I have had. And I think it does often, you know, there's this kind of diagram of sometimes, um, you know, when you when you are you have different parts of your identity are often marginalized or oppressed. Sometimes you can see what everybody else is experiencing, but when you don't have those things, you don't see anything um, below you, essentially. Mm. Um, and I think it does, if you read the book, my kind of first encounters kind of like with racism and then encounters with, you know, racism within a medical setting. For me, really, when I entered medical school, and although I was, you know, conscious of racism, conscious of these things, even conscious of, like, my, my family's migration story, I wouldn't say that these things were ever necessarily so much at the forefront of my mind. But every time I had one of these experiences, it made me start kind of going, aha, so I wonder how that person must be feeling, or I wonder how that person must be feeling. And it changed my interest. Like I went to medical school ultimately thinking that I might become an orthopedic surgeon because I had major spinal surgery when I was 14, you know, and I wanted to, you know, go and do spinal surgery. And I thought it would like be really interesting. And I thought I was going to, you know, change the game. And I left obviously lots of medical students completely changing their mind. But for me, it was really shaped by some of the experiences I had. I wanted to go into a specialty where it fused the social, the public health, 
all of these other things that I started seeing on my doorstep as an as important, you know. So uh, UCL where I went is um, my family live around North London, but as an area, you know, it's got it's got a huge gap in terms of like um, wealth gap and social deprivation. It's, I think as a borough, it might even have the highest rate of uh, drug misuse in the country, um, and you see how that feeds in to like mental health issues, which I pick up on in kind of, you know, looking at the discrepancy between places like Archway and Highgate, which are right next to each other, <laughs> but completely, completely different. And, you know, I was just kind of like, there is just so much more going on here that when we sit in lectures that people are willing to discuss or make yeah. room for, right? And I just felt like, well, actually, I want to go into a specialty where there's a bit more capacity to discuss these things and maybe people can learn from us because from yeah. the history of the specialty, there's some things that we've had to kind of accept as necessary to discuss because of the very virtue of the specialty, right? You know, um, so when we talk about sexual health and like the links to mental health and social issues and like a case study for that is like, you know, HIV, right? And what happened to drug access mm. there? Who got access and, you know, who mattered because who this was affecting? People would learn lessons, maybe not as many as we'd like people to have learned. <laughs> but I felt like, I felt like from, you know, learning as a medical student, learning um, in my foundation years, that it was a, it was an area that I gravitated towards because of the discussions that I felt I could have. Um, and those were very much governed by my personal encounters and how I was shaped during that medicalization process, which I often call a conveyor belt. And I could do a whole nother essay. <laughs> Oh, process of doctors, you know. Um, Fantastic. Which, yeah. Well, that's absolutely okay. brilliant. And unfortunately, we've run out of time. Oh, God. To carry on for <laughs> <laughs> uh, Annabelle, thank you so much for, for coming on. I would say anyone watching, should we do the get three people? <laughs> <laughs> it's so brilliant yeah get to find it thanks annabelle thank you so much and i'm thanks sorry you. About you. yeah no such important point it, 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 no it's wonderful and we're just uh look we're just looking forward to hearing all the great things that are going to happen and yeah, winning fantastic. more prizes yeah <laughs> more pro all well prize yes. nominated yeah <laughs> Thank you. I'm just happy to be there. And I'm sorry, long clinical day. So, um, you know, my mind's a bit frazzled. But I really appreciate yeah. it. Thank you so much. Thank, um, thank you. Thank, you. Thanks very much. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. That's gone so quickly. It feels so cliche when you say it, but it does go very, very quickly. <laughs> it does. Yeah. Let's say a huge thank you to Annabelle and Jessica. Thank you to Brilliant Disruptive Live for making all of this happen. Thank you to the lottery for making this possible financially. Definitely. Um, and thank you to you, Susan, as ever. Um, always <laughs> love co-hosting with you. <laughs> and we're just looking forward to seeing you all again. Thank you for tuning in and um, looking forward to seeing you again on the 19th of June, Monday, the That's 19th. Right. And thank you, Vanessa. See you all on the 19th of June. Bye. Yeah, bye-bye.